God, that would be... Where are we, man? Boys, man, where oh, are no, we? I can't find a way around. Let's Careful, there's a car coming as well. Let's just knock let's, on this door. Okay, let's go and rock at this door. Warren Hewitt from Produce Like a Pro. What? Lee Anderton of Anderton Anderson Lee Lee Anderton. Oh man, how are you? I'm good. Marvelous to see you. Come on oh, in. Hello, I'm doing, man. Good come to see on, you. you come on in. <laughs> I don't know where we're going. Oh, that was so much oh, fun. It's fun. I've played well, that, guitar with you like that since we were like well, 24 and 21. Frighteningly, or whatever. Uh, yeah. yes. I think I was 24 and you were like 21. Yeah, so back in the day, Warren and I worked for arch rival music stores. Yes. Because you worked for Kingfishers. In I Fleet, did. Didn't you? And I, I obviously did. worked at Anderton's. And then I don't. Why, why was that? Why did you work at Anderton's? Yeah, I don't know. Why did, <laughs> and then, and then you. Why did you come and work at Anderton's? Because I met you. Is that what it was? You I think I defected. Up, you defected. You did, left Kingfishers and came to work for you, us. No, you actually stole me. You know what? You want me to be really honest? Did what we, happened? Did I head? Did we? Did you we? You headhunted like, me. Oh, awesome. He came over to my house. I remember that. And you gave me all these forms to fill in, and you tested. Nick Merton, was it? Or? Was it Smurty? No, I think Smurty, Smur for those who know Yes, it. Smurty. I think Smurty, I think that we've figured that out later. But anyway, and then Warren and I came really good friends. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then you left Anderton's, and quite when, soon after that, you moved out here, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, moved with to a the band. Los Angeles with a band. With a band, and then like lost touch, as you do. And, and then literally just... You did a YouTube thing, obviously you're, you know, and then I started, I saw you and I'm thinking, wow, and you've got this like killer produced like a pro channel on YouTube and you just think, and then it literally is frighteningly 25, 30 odd years later. I mean, I'm sitting, five years ago. I'm sitting in your studio. And, and, uh, 23. Jamming. So come on, fill in the, fill in the blanks. You, we, but this uh, is fun. I, look, just pause for a second. You, you play blues like I play blues. Well, right, just slower. No, 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 do. that was, that was like, <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like yeah. when I play with some people, like a lot of people, it's just like, they play blues, okay. 
You know what I mean? It's like that all made sense. Uh, that was like that was like coming home. It's very yeah. kind of you. I no, must no, admit, no, you were one of the fir- you were one of the first guitar players that I ever worked with that I really wanted to play like. You know, what I mean, it's like because it, you were you're too kind. You've been good for a long time. Well, no. So come on, look. So tell us. Um, what have I done the last four million years? Well, I just remember you. What was the you you I remember when you left Andertons. You, I was in a band you, and we got a record deal. But you were, you had a ba- you were as a, you were the bass player in, in I was like a, bass a player. like a punky poppy rocky yeah. band thing. What were they called again? Star sixty nine. Oh god, that's now right. you, you're going to find photos of me with uh, yeah. But you you had success in the US, didn't you? More so than in the UK. No, no, we had band. success in the UK. We, oh, okay. we, yeah, we ended up having uh, we got I think it was Melody Maker, Enemy, and and uh, we had. a single in the charts and all that kind of silly stuff but we came to america seeking fame and fortune right did out did an album over here with don smith it was absolutely amazing check him out his resume is insane did tom petty and a whole bunch of other great stuff and so we did an album with him and then um you know toured and did all that thing came back to england play shows toured around america a bunch of times and then um i did actually start another band and get another record deal very short-lived but all the time i was recording because when i because when, when we met, yes, I, we were on the guitar floor mm. when we were working together, but I used to sell recording stuff. You didn't have a huge amount of recording yeah. stuff in those days, but you yeah. had PA stuff, and I could sell PAs. Yes. Yeah. So I would sell PA equipment and guitars. Yeah. So I've just always, you know, I was, I've always a guitar player, but I always wanted to record. I always wanted to, you know what I mean? I had studios, and uh, yeah, it was fun. So I came over here, and uh, after the successive record deals, I was always doing the demos for my bands that got my band signed. So it was just sort of natural that I keep recording demos. And I, I had like a Soundtracks Topaz console and three ADATs for anybody that remembers ADATs. Back yeah. in the day Back when you couldn't just record your band with like a 99p app on your iPhone. You actually had to spend <laughs> some money in those days to buy the gear. Yeah. Uh, no. So how, what... what I mean, again, we've lost touch over that time. So it's just, even though we're recording this, it's fun to just sort of find out what happened. But so when, when did you um, decide that the band, you didn't want to actually sort of be part of the band anymore? You wanted to sort of sit behind the console and... I think I always did. Right. Because um, when, I was a, when I was a kid, all the bands I loved were all like Queen and all about production and mm. great songs and less about like you know, the sex, drugs and rock and roll, although that was kind of fun when we were kids, <laughs> as you know. Um, but you know what I mean? I fell in love with music really young. I was like, um, my dad bought me a night at the opera when I think I was seven. Right. So, and he only listened to classical music. So oh, he like okay. bought, me, bought me this album and, and said, this is worthy. <laughs> like you're allowed to listen to this. This band's really good, you know. And um, yeah, so it's weird. So it, I always was in love with music before I even understood, you know, all the other connotations that music could have. So I think recording is like the place where you can be in love with music all day. Um, what was your first sort of big opportunity in the sense, well, you know, when was the start, did you, did you produce the Star 69 stuff as well? I did some that? of it, yeah, I did some of it. The, the initial stuff was done by Patch, Patch's, oh, yeah, yeah, Patch yeah. and Patch's yeah. brother. You know, Patch is the drummer of the Sundays for those of you in uh, and he was, because uh, of course... Then, then he was you, a customer of yours because he lived about 20 yards other, from did, you. Did you know Luke Baldry, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I knew bit, Luke. So he's gone on, because he was doing... He's worth for United, uh, UA now. UA, yeah. but he was, he again had a, a studio, didn't he, in, yeah. in Farm? Earth Terminal. That was Earth Terminal. That was, that was pretty successful, wasn't it? Yeah, he took over our old studio. We had, we had Blast world. Street. The first one was called um, Studio Poisson, Studio Fish. And then the second one was called Blast Street Studios. And then Nick, Patch's brother, ran it and decided, you know, it's okay, got married and said, I, I'm moving away. And so Luke, that studio you're talking about was my old studio with Patch oh. and Nick and the Jameson but brothers. Some, and big na- some big names went through that Oh, studio, yeah, we had uh, Guy Chambers, Kylie Minogue. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean. Wow. Yeah, it's. So, but so were there? Were you learning production techniques just by doing it yourself and making mistakes, or did you work with other producers that really influenced you? Doing myself you and just all making mistakes. I think as a, I think as a musician and having a bunch of record deals and, and making albums um, is definitely a baptism of fire. You go in there. Like I, I, even when I was recording, recording, I had like a compressor. You remember the Ulysses thirty six thirty? Oh yeah. They still make those. They probably do. I though. hope not. Yeah, I hope not too. <laughs> but it, you remember you used to put a signal through it, and all the low end would just disappear. You like put a bass guitar, and it came out sounding. 
you're like, what happened? <laughs> um, but anyway, um, you know, I had things, but I didn't really know what they did. And then I remember going into the studio for the first time, a proper mm. studio. And you, probably, you must remember this experience. You put a pair of headphones on and a guy that, a person that knows what they're doing, like has that compressor set up beautifully and you kind of go, and you hear that poing and you're like, you're like, what is that? And I remember just being like, this is magic. This sounds like a record. This sounds like what all the stuff I grew up listening to. So I just fell in love with all of that. And um, yeah, I was just always doing demos. I had, you know, like everybody else, prob lots of people, I started off with uh, my dad's cassette player, my dad's hi-fi, and you play guitar into one cassette player, you put it in the hi-fi, play it through the speakers, and then record the overdub live right. over the top onto the other cassette player. So I'd build up like hissy, you know, I'd figure out, you know, and then go, you know, bit of, bit of build up really bad out of time and out of tune harmonies <laughs> with tons of hiss in them. And that's how I got started. Then I borrowed a Porter One, remember that? Yeah, Tascam Porter One. Whew. That was the last recording product that I actually knew how to use, I think, probably still is. <laughs> yeah, and then, but then when, you know, when I was working with the, the, the brothers at uh, Blast Street in Poisson, that was an MSR 24. So it was a one inch 24 track. Yeah. And then when I moved over here, I already was used to consoles. We had a, a soundtracks console and an MSR 24. And so I came over here and then got ADATs. Yeah. Cause, and a little, like I said, soundtracks Topaz, which was actually not a bad little console. It was like gray and pastel colors. We talk, we'll talk about the gear, because I'm always sort of fascinated how, um, you know, when you go into a pro studio, they're still using the same basic oh, yeah. analog equipment that's been used for, you know, 30 or 40 years, maybe more. Yep. Um, but they're usually using a, it's an a element of digital yeah. in with it as well. Yep. But um, I'm, st I'm still kind of, because your, your sort of production credits have gone like proper insane. And, and obviously yeah, that's a, great. So, so how, does, you know, how does that even happen when you, how do you, is it just people you met living in LA? Yeah, and? a little bit of that. I also developed a lot of artists. So I'd get artists signed, I'd get them record deals. You get to be friends with A&R guys. You know, um, the business is quite different in America than it is in England. You know, when we got, when we got, we got our band signed, we took our demo, got the band signed, and then they actually put out the demos. And I thought that was what was going to happen in, in America. And they were like, no, we're going to give it to our friends to reproduce. Thanks for helping us out, mm. Sonny. So it was a little bit of a rude awakening. You right. know? Um, it's far more business oriented in Los Angeles and in, and in oh, America. Oh, I mean, give them, to your fr give them to your friends just so that they get the production credits and you don't. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. And that's, that, that has changed quite dramatically because of this wonderful world that we're living in, the internet. You know, it's... Uh, you know, the money's not there like it was. So now it's like, how can we get the best results for the least amount of money? Mm. You know, because you're not, you know, and I'm sure you, you live in that world every day anyway. You're, you're always looking for products that you want to represent and get behind that you know, you know, are going to sell a schnizzle ton to people that give, <laughs> that give a crap that, you know, it's for every uh, handmade $100,000 something, you're going to sell 100000 of, you know, something a little bit more value. I like this, I love these Yamahas. I know you're not the biggest fan of it, but the Revstar is, I'm I love it. I'm too old and traditional. I like things yeah. like this, you see. <laughs> which, is, which is totally cool. But I can get behind this because it's 699 bucks, you know, yeah. and it sounds great. So I can play it and use it on albums and use it in videos, knowing that a kid can go into a store and get a glued neck, really nice guitar, for yeah. less than a thousand dollars, and so I, I've sort, of, and also I feel, I'm sure you do as well, because I know your videos are so honest. Mm. You have a sense of responsibility. Well, we talk, we talk, Anderson. We're in a really lucky place with Andersons. In, in you're an insanely good place. We don't, uh, we don't need people to buy every single thing that we yeah. video review. And of course, I suppose with a lot of people who are making a living out of reviewing stuff, yeah. they kind of the the benchmark of success of that video will be, well, how, how many did we sell as a, as a brand yeah. that has paid for that product video? And I, I, Anderson's is lucky because it's like, as long as the people who watch our videos buy something from us, sure. um, it doesn't matter whether they buy the thing we video or something else. They just, so I think we're able to just stay true and honest as, 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 much, as, you, as much as you can. But uh, look, this, for me, this, I'm this just, is, I'm, this I is about you, not about No, not no, about but us. I feel the same way. I'm always looking for things that I know, like this guitar, like certain mm. like inexpensive plugins or hardware, stuff mm. I can really get behind because I know it's really good and, and it helps people. But, and isn't everything, it's all an opinion anyway, isn't it? It's definitely you an know, opinion. It's yeah. only, it's, 
And even the science is, is kind of irrelevant as well because there's an emotional response to stuff. It's like mm. there's amazing studios all over the world. But if I take you, you know, took you into Studio One in Sunset Sound and told you, oh, by the way, they cut Stairway to Heaven drums over here and they did this or whatever it is, you're just going to be like, wow. And then I say, oh, let's record a song. You're just going to be like, wow. Mm. I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, there's, there's so much more to music than just or anything than zeros and ones and steel and plastic and wood or whatever. <laughs> That's just a little tiny piece of what makes us do this stupid so, thing that we do. So you're, <laughs> you're in LA, yep. you're running, you're, you're obviously making a living out of producing people, making a good living out of producing bands. Did, I, did, you, did you stop playing, like as in... A live, a, yeah. I yeah, stopped, so playing completely live stopped playing live early 2000s and mm -hmm. then I just concentrated on doing this. Um, but you know, I Will play, you play on, on a, you'll play on a record if pretty much be. everything I do I play on, yeah. Right. Okay. Sometimes they know I am and some like, No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. But are you, and are you um, so you're making a living out of that. Um, yep. I'm, I'm making a good living. I mean as I said, there's photographs in your house if you're working with, you know, Aerosmith and a ton of other, you know, crazy bands that, you know, so it was obviously big time. But where did the was there a desire to do the produce like a pro thing or was it a demand for it or was it a did you literally see a commercial opportunity i mean where, where does it all i think there's probably a little bit of all of those but i don't think i like yourself um i remember when you and i first reconnected when we were doing youtube i was early stages you've been doing it for maybe a couple of years longer than me but we were both like philosophical about it like yeah it's kind of a fun thing to do yeah, yeah. you know and at that stage i don't think i had even put an ad on a video mm. i didn't really it's like there was definitely a sense of like yourself a build it and they will come do quality stuff be consistent people will will trust that you you you, you know what you you're doing but for me i never want to stop making music so i'm always a little concerned i never want to be a pro considered to be a professional youtuber you know what I mean? That's that's the one thing that because then what happens is like because what what I hope and maybe people can disagree with this, but I hope that people know that I do music for a living and mm. I show you what I do while I'm doing music for a living. That's my value. My value mm. is this is what I do for a living. There's not a single thing. Okay, I think Yamaha did actually give me this guitar. <laughs> they lent it to me and I haven't asked for it back. So it's on permanent loan. You, you get the email now tomorrow yeah, morning. Yeah, now I will. <laughs> but, <laughs> Can we have that back, please? But, you know, I bought the Gentle X 20 plus years ago. You know, the console, I definitely sweat and tears. Everything in that rack is paid for. That rack's paid for. I mean, an expensive freaking gear. These are yeah. racks I've got gear I've had for 25 years I've been building up. You know, so I do get occasional things for free mm. or a deal. I'm sure you do as well. I mean, that's life. But the reason why I have the studio is because I've done music my whole life mm. to get to this place, just like you. And it's like we we live, eat, and breathe it. And you know, I know it's easy to say, but you, I love it. Not always. Not every day. Sometimes it's a lot of work. But you know that phrase. You know, um, you know, do what you love and make money as a consequence yes. of it. You know, I think that's. You know, that, that, that's, that's the thing for me. One thing I will say about what we do is what I like about um, is I don't mind if I have a million views or 10,000 views on a video because I know the only people that watch my videos care about recording. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably what's so great about what we do. It's like, you know, when you see comments and stuff and you're doing like a, you, you're jamming guitar, that people are only there to s see you play guitar and talk about guitars and amps and pedals. I, it's freaking awesome. I still think you're I think, side, come on. I mean, it, I think, I, I admire the because the production side I think is um, is a, is a quite a complex skill set I think you know I mean gu the guitar side I like what we do on the guitar side because it for me our videos were about finding two people that could connect with each other about around music yeah. and the gear that's in the video is almost second fiddle sure. to that connection of what happens when two people make music together and they just and they and there's a bond that occurs and I think fundamentally actually as a as a as a music store I actually think we're selling that more than we're selling you know we're selling sure. the joy I agree. of making music and the fact that we sell instruments is almost like well you just you need to have them to to make the music but you know, yeah. you know. anyway but the production side of things is you know that's a skill set that you've got to learn, and that's a, a minefield of an area in terms of you know what what do you buy and how do you use it, and particularly, you know when we 
first started, I always used to feel that the, the financial investment to put a studio together was such that really you'd only do it if you were going to go and do mm. it full time. So you would you'd put sure. the energy in and, the, and you'd learn it. But now the now cost, you can be a hobbyist you can for be a less hobbyist. than a thousand pounds. Yeah. Oh, probably not even that. Yeah, you you yeah. can have Garage Band for free, can't you? It's like, but I think a thousand pounds or less buys you dollars, yeah. buy, buys you headphones, interface, yeah. decent mic, you know. But yeah. the, the expectation now, I think, is that, well, I'll just do it for half an hour at the weekends. And you're sure. like, well, how on earth do you learn to, to use all this amazing kit? So I guess that's where you're... So I come in, I think, I think you know, I, and I like what you're saying about the joy of making music. For me, I, and that really helps me focus on what I, what I wanted to say. For me, a lot of the time, I just want to prove that it's not magic. Mm -hmm. And that it's not like this, woo, you know, because... When I was coming up, I don't know about you, but you know, I was coming out and first going into studios. I just thought that there was some kind of gifted, ethereal kind of sprinkled mm. like dust on everything that was just going to make everything amazing. And uh, after having success and having records that did really, really well, I realized it's just roll up your sleeves and get, get going mm. in there and get creative. And I, I say this all the time. So if anybody who's watched me on my videos, Jeff Emmerich was 19 turning 20 years old when he engineered Revolver. So this whole idea that you have to be an expert, you know, mm. it's just, it should be just about like getting in there and just making mm. some music. You know, do you think the Beatles knew what a Phrygian mode was or a, you know, we know this is not the way that great music we grew up is made. Music is made from just going, oh, what's this? Oh, I like that. What if I go? You know, they're not analyzing the, mm. so I think. I like that because one thing that scares me sometimes, what I love about YouTube is the information, and the thing that sometimes scares me about it is when it gets a little bit too like up its own bottom and starts <laughs> becoming like, well, you see, the thing is they were doing, you know. It's like, you know what they were doing? They were plugging in a guitar mm -hmm. and making some noise, you know. And uh, so that's the bit I like to, I hope that the, the part that we can do is just go, you know what, it's okay. It's okay if you plugged it in and accidentally distorted it and because... All the good sounds. All the good accidents. sounds happen that way. Yeah. All the Beatles things um, were all accidents. So, who would get? Who would cut the better album? Would if I could have all the stuff in this room? Yep. But a sort of a relatively novice level mm -hmm. understanding of what being a producer is, and all you were allowed was Garage Band and an SM58. For everything. Uh, so unfair. Who, you, who, who would who well, would make the better album? <laughs> well, it depends on your level of knowledge. If you didn't have a level of knowledge, you could probably spend half half an hour trying to figure out how to get a signal down one uh, channel. That would be me, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, but... I mean that's the reality. Is like, yeah, <laughs> that's where it can be difficult. Because... But assuming I could at least work out how to record a, a channel, you know, is it? I'm I'm sort of I think I know the answer in that with music that I've heard recorded over the, over the years, the skill of the producer is. Uh, what makes the difference, not the if the, the yeah, hit. depending on how you describe a producer, because there's there's a fifteen different words, to mm. more than that. There's a thousand different interpretations of producer. I often get asked. I'm sure you do as well. You know, p people. I'm sure write to you for, for recording advice as well. You have recording ideas. <laughs> well, you know, but to, to yeah, you guys, the staff, editors. Yeah. And when somebody says to me, "What does a producer do?" I because people don't. They're more visual than they are, mm. which is why DOW is so successful. They're more visual than they are, um, you know, auditory. So I think that I always just respond by going, they're a director. And they're like, well, directors can sometimes, remember um, Tim Burton once said, yeah. right. and I quote, wouldn't know a good script if it hit me in the head. Do you remember that? It was like a right. really famous quote. He's a visual director, but doesn't direct the actors. He lets the actors, he, he lets them interpret mm -hmm. the way he wants. Okay, so that's one kind of directing. That's like somebody that is really good at like building tracks and soundscapes, but wouldn't know how to get you to sing really well. Mm. Wouldn't know, like, oh, Lee, you're out of tune, you're in time, mm -hmm. I, I don't believe what you're saying, I need you to be more honest, I need you to be more guttural. Wouldn't know how to communicate with you to get a great vocal. But that doesn't mean it's not valid. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you've got guys like Jack Douglas, who I've done many records with, who's the exact opposite, who doesn't give a crap what mic you use, whether you're on a one inch, a two inch, a digital, whatever. He thinks that is completely irrelevant. But he wants to make sure that everybody in the band feels important. When I worked with him, it was like, bing! I was like, rocks, toys in the attic. Now I get how those amazing records were made. Because every single person in that room did their best work. 
It was like the best drum parts they ever played, the best bass lines they ever played, the best guitar lines. I mean, all of their hits are pretty much, mm -hmm. at least all their 70s are on those two albums. And it's because he just knows how to make your idea. Oh, I like that. Let's try mm -hmm. that. You know, try going over there. You know, stand closer to the amp, blah, blah, blah. And you walk out feeling like, wow, he values me and he encouraged me and got a performance out of mm -hmm. me. That is not something you can do with a DAW or garage band. That's a different skill set. Mm -hmm. So that's where the answer is a little bit tricky because if it's you on your own, um, you can do amazing results, get amazing results. But just having that, not a captain, not a, uh, not a, not a cheerleader, <laughs> but somebody that yeah. you know, can get something from you, it's in incredible. Is, is that, I mean, which camp do you think you sit in personally uh, as a I, producer? Uh, because, because I don't, because because anybody worth their salt, as you know, would never rate themselves. I feel like I, I'm just, I feel honestly like I just try to do, learn from all of these incredible people I've worked with and try to figure out at what time do I need to go, oh, yeah, you need to be there. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's all it is. I, I feel like anybody who's even a guitar player, a producer, whatever it is, you, we all know we're standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, like, you know, right hand technique, Aldo Miola was doing that in the mid 70s. Legato was was all Alan Holdsworth in the 70s. You know what I mean? It's like weirdness was nailed by Fripp Fripp and Robert Fripp and you know what I mean? So that's great. I, lo I love watching all these young up and coming great guitar players, but we also know just those three or four guys alone still yeah. blow everybody else out of the water, which is okay. Um, so I feel like we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So now we have this amazing opportunity to maybe take a little bit of you know, what Holdsworth is doing, for instance, speaking about guitar players, mixed in with a little bit of the right hand from Audi mm. Miola, but a little bit of Kossoff on the vibrato, you know what I mean? It's like, that's the wonderful world we live in. So production's the same thing. It's like, I want to have a skill set to get a great performance out of you, but also have the skills to build a really exciting track that you might be yeah. want to actually sing on or play guitar over. So, what, so what do you, it's uh, a big challenge, though, because it's... And where, where have you... Uh, how do you incorporate a digit, the digital aspect to your studio? Are you just using it as, as a replacement for a tape machine, or are you using it for... No, I'm, I, I, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges and one of the most exciting things I did is I, I did three albums with Dave Sardi, and we did um, Ad Thrill's second album, um, Let's Bold Bohemia, the Irish band. We did Hot Heat's second record, and he... He really challenged me because he would come in with like a wad of notes and I was the digital editor and he'd go, um, follow my notes and nothing was cut to a click and it had all been transferred from tape into Pro Tools. So I had to learn how to edit and make things feel natural, like take the bar that he liked from here and the verse from there and the bridge from here and this mm -hmm. and put it all together and make it make sense and make it feel like human beings played and not just stick it on a grid. So that was challenging because he would, he would give me the notes to build it. I'd piece them all together out of like 14 takes. And sometimes it was whole chunks, don't get me wrong. And then sometimes it was fills from here and a bit from there. Um, in just the same way that people used to do on tape. You mm. should just cut it up and go, we'll take that verse from this song and from this take and that one. And he just challenged me. So what I ended up doing was, was learning how to be, you know, do sort of invisible editing. Mm -hmm as opposed to just kind of gridding. Not that gridding sometimes doesn't work. I mean, if you're doing an EDM track, you want it to be a freaking metronome. You know what I mean? Mm. It's, as we like to say in England, horses for courses. <laughs> but, it's so, so, but it is just from an editing perspective. Are you, would you, you'd rather, I mean, have you come across any digital alternatives to any of the output yeah, here that you're? Yeah, a lot, a lot. So what is it that, what's the appeal then of the old fashioned output? It's, it, well, it's because it's, it's more of the inboard. What it is, is the getting the signal in. Right. It's like Jack Sheps talks about this a lot. He mixes entirely in a box on a pair of headphones with no analog summing whatsoever, just opens up his laptop in his hotel room, puts on his Sony 7506s, 100 pound headphones through a couple thousand dollar laptop and Bob's your uncle and he's probably got like a grand's worth of plugins and he's mixing. That whole setup is less than people mm. used to charge a day for a studio to mix in. His setup and it's permanent mm. and he owns it. And so, but what he insists upon and what he wants and what anybody worth their salt is they want it to go through all as much beautiful, fat, warm, lovely. Mm. Warm is such a horrible word, I can't believe I used it, but I did. Um, you know, just really nice equipment. I always like to say weight, because transformers, mm. as you know, even in guitar amps, the transformers give you so much weight, they give you that kind of girth that we love. So as much of that that's going on, going in, to, in on the way in, then when you come to mix, sure, 
slap on a pair of headphones, sit in the corner of your living room with the feet up and just mix the thing. It's, it's a whole different world. Um, but, you know, digital's getting better and better and better. There's just certain tolerances with, uh, you know, value for money. I'm really excited, I'm sure you are as well, about what SSL are going to do with this. Have you heard about this? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I see. they're doing a two input interface. Yeah. Oh, cool. So you've got this company's name mm. on an inexpensive interface. They're going to blow the market open, wow. which has been dominated by we all know who for such a long time. Yeah. And they're going to come in with an innovative product. There's another company I'm on, uh, on an NDA, so I can't say it because it might come out before it comes out, who are also doing another affordable I.O. Mm. So these are really going to elevate it because the problem has been at the moment with some of the cheaper stuff is they just don't quite have the tolerances. As I'm sure you, you know when you guys record, you just hit it a little bit too hard and it's not a pleasant clipping. It's a and mm. okay, you can get around with it, you can edit it, whatever, but it's just every day things are getting better mm. and better and better. So to answer a very long question, there's so much I love about this, yeah. but it's not all necessary. But I do love amps, don't you? Uh... Yes, I'd be lying if I said that, um, I mean, I'm, my experiences of, of working in an environment like this are, 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 are pretty minimal, but certainly when we've done some stuff with Universal Audio, I would, they'll follow the same thing, that you're, which is the, the actual sound is captured and recorded sure. using all this kind of stuff, and then yeah. the final mix is, is done on a laptop, basically. The, the thing is, is you only really need one decent chain. Mm. Once you're out of recording drums with four to 16 mics, depending on how you want to do it, Glenn John's three mics, four mics, whatever it is, up to individually miking everything, whatever that experience is, once you're away from live drums, most guitars, you know, I know you said you like to double mic, but most people record guitars with a 57 on the front of a cone. Mm. And if you've got that going into a nice preamp and maybe a compressor if you want to compress in the way in, that's it. Most of your life is going to be in that place. Then you pick up, maybe you unplug the 57 and throw in a condenser and you're doing a vocal. So outside of recording drums, you only really need a handful of really mm. nice, like, and yeah, you could spend a thousand or two thousand pounds on something that sounds really nice preamp, but that's a lifetime investment and mm. will record everything. That guitar, that bass, that piano, that vocal, everything. Mm. So a lot of this is a little bit more about in a situation where I've got a band in the live room, sometimes I have a bass player, a guitar player sitting there, a guy doing scratch vocals, maybe even a keyboard player. It's nice to have extra class A you know, gear going on the way in. But once, if you're working on your own and you've got most project studios, mm. you don't need a lot of gear, you just need a couple of really nice pieces. And Is, any, is anybody making new stuff that you like, or is it all about getting yeah. on Reverb and eBay um, and finding... Uh, yeah, Tegeler Audio, definitely. Which, sorry? Tegeler, you know Tegeler, or Tegeler, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I don't know if that's a brand that we do. Yeah, yeah, I can see you've got a, you know, a few units so in there, and they're just preamps, are they? No, that, that is a compressor, right. and a compressor and a Poltec style, not a Poltec, but a Poltec style EQ in one. Put it on the bus, sounds absolutely amazing. And, and the, guy, the guy's a genius. He's in Berlin, and he's... Okay and he builds great stuff. I think there's a lot of amazing speaker uh, manufacturers. I really love the Callies. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you sell them. We you know. do. They're like, oh, well, they're the same 300 pounds. They're certainly mid, sort of mid to, you know, they're not expensive, are they, mid-price kind yeah, of stuff? Yeah, the, the, these are the RP6s, so they're $300 in America, powered, probably 300 pounds, and, and they sound pretty darn good, especially for the money. And so there's definitely newer stuff that I get behind. Um, Focal, a company I've, mm -hmm. I, I really like, and of course Genelec have been killing it for decades. Other than the desk, what's the craziest, most expensive bit of outboard that you've got in here? Probably a mic. Oh really? I have a U47. Okay. Yeah, so that's like a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar just for a microphone. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What do you use that for? Just vocals. Vocals, yeah. But yeah. I use modern mics as well. It's that's all just crazy, you know what you want. I mean, the tape machine. It's, you know, at one stage it was probably a hundred grand. It's probably now worth, <laughs> yeah. It's got a, it's got an it, Andy Guitar last, Geek wig. When was the last time you recorded it? I was talking to Andy the other day and I put on the wig when he wasn't looking <laughs> and I came back and I was like, so... Uh, so when, when was the last time you recorded to tape? Uh, I recorded to tape relatively recently somewhere else, um, but I haven't used that tape machine in about three or four years, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, it's been about three or four years since we've done anything on tape. We did... There was a time when that was kind of our thing. People would come to us to track stuff on tape and maybe put it into Pro Tools for editing and stuff like that. But actually, it's, it's just died off because there's, there's less of those where to lock out a place for a few mm. weeks to make a record things. And when you're working on tape, you can't just go, 
you know, bada boom, bada bing, another song, there we go. Yeah, yeah. You've got to change reels, you've got to... It, it adds up when you're... You know, I did an album in a day at Sunset Sound Studio 3. In a day, cut the whole thing. And then did vocals the next day and we were done, mixed. That's great. So going back to the, the, the sort of produce like a pro thing, yep. is that... Um, is that aiming at quite a breadth of uh, people wanting to learn about production or, yep. you know, right down to someone that's just got like some sort of two in, two out affordable interface and a pair of headphones or... or yeah, it's everything. That, that was, because you asked me earlier why I started it, um, I wanted to be sort of in the middle. I remember when I started, um, uh, Graham, you know, Recording Revolution had been going for like four or five years and then Pensado had been going for like four or five years and they had these kind of opposite ideas of it, both of which were completely valid. You know, Dave was very like, you know, hey, you're amazing, lots of like really famous people and stuff like that. And then Graham, you know, God bless him, was starting people off. He was like, people were coming in and he was answering the most basic need and getting people making mm -hmm. music. So I saw these two opposite sides and I thought to myself, there's nobody in the middle. There's nobody connecting everybody. And, you know, because I was always that little scrappy kid that just sort of wanted to know, I, I, I sort of came in and it was sort of an attitude of like, kick down the doors and make it less expert orientated. And I've always been sort of yeah. opposed, even though, you know, I'm learned and I know my scales and blah, 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 and all that stuff. I know the music I love is just kind of guttural and passionate and, you know what I mean? Even Bohemian Rhapsody, as complex as it is, they worked out the parts, they didn't, theorize the parts you know mm. what I mean it was it was it's a passionate piece of music yeah you know it's not a choral symphony you know? as much as I actually like choral symphonies did but, you realize you're going to get ADD Warren when you interview me no this is, <laughs> this is this is this is all good so I'm because I I can't, so how many you, you know if you were if someone's watching this and thinking well I you know I'd <laughs> someone's like to, watching this thank yeah. you thank you thank you from the bottom of my heart if well, you're watching this. <laughs> how many how many hours do you think you need to put in to just get f from you know so you've gone out and you've spent your you know thousand bucks on some some relatively you know you've got you've, you already own a laptop you've got a little interface yep. and a couple of mics and a pair of headphones and you're like right ready to go how many hours do you think they need watching, you know, either watching your channel or reading? If it was me, it, yeah. I'd start recording and then figure out what you didn't know, then go and find the videos. Right, you literally yeah, would just go straight in. Yeah, the same thing, isn't that, isn't that our thing? I don't know. Are you, are you, do you read the manual, be honest? No, you? no. <laughs> there you in go. fact, <laughs> I, I get deeply offended if, uh, if anyone even suggests that I ought to. Okay. Um, so I would open it up. I would definitely see the, uh, how you plug it in. Mm. You know, you, got, you, you take your interface, like, you know, and we use inexpensive interfaces all day. We, um, you know, you know, Audion and Andy the, and all those say, guys. The one, that one, yeah, we yeah. love those guys. You, like, are you coming down to the NAMM show? I am, yes, I'm so, gonna be, I'm doing a full day of panels on Friday. Whole day, AES asked me to do, to actually set up the day. So I've got four panels in a row. Then I'm going to John Crivet's educational thing. Because, you know, all joking aside, the educational stuff is really super important. It's, it's always been something. The NAM, the NAM education program is, it's so good. And yet, we're, you know, there's so much other stuff for us to do at the NAM show. <laughs> it's like we, we can't, it's, I never get the chance to ever see any of it. Oh, what's he got? He's got a BAFTA or something. It's from NAM. It's the Tech Award. Ah, oh, well done. So technical excellence in... Is that like being the second best YouTube personality of the year? I think. Yeah, second done. best, yeah. <laughs> oh, is that what you got? That's what we got this year. You got second best? <laughs> second best. Yeah, it's, it's 2019 NAM Technical Excellence Creative Awards for Audio Education Technology. So what, come on, you're a man education on the is really inside, clearly, more than I am. I just, uh, other I just, than this SSL thing, what, what are you excited about being launched at the NAM? And this, uh, this won't come out before the NAM show's on, so any NDA about um, not mentioning or, is, is Audion have be an okay. affordable one that's coming out that, that they're doing under a different brand. I think they're calling it Evo. You're not, more you know affordable than the more Second? affordable than the little. I think we did a video on. Oh, so you've already done the video. I think they've been down to do. Didn't they come and do a video with us? Yeah, on that yeah they're doing one with me mm. next week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but they, more they more affordable than the I can't uh -huh. remember what it was called. They're coming out different They're calling it the Evo. Wow. How much Mr. Do you boss, think is he not supposed to know this? Is he, is he just so high up the food chain? No. Basically, is he, is he on the beach it, every day? Honest, sipping, if it hasn't, got, sipping my if it hasn't got strings on it, I don't understand, so I yeah. just ignore. <laughs> uh, what's how much in the What's your dad doing now, anyway? Is he just completely retired yeah, out of it? 250. Yeah, Dad food. hasn't. Uh, dad, we, this always makes me laugh. Dad Cause, is cause, such a perfectionist yeah. and so finds it so impossible 
not to come into the store and start critiquing. I was going to say criticising. It's not criticising, but critiquing how things are done. So basically, he's just banned. He's just not allowed in. So he's not even set foot in the door for probably 10 years. Yeah, See, what's so interesting? Good. So it was, the, it was the same amount. What's probably happened is you think about it generation-wise. When it was 25, 30 years ago, I was working with you at Anderton's. Your dad, you were the kid. Your, oh, dad, sure. your dad was there running the place. Yep. And if you flip back 25, 30 years before, he was in the store with your granddad doing exactly the same oh, thing. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's all cool. I mean, it's just... No, it's amazing. Uh, it's, um, he, he's... So the question is, do you have a son? No, I've got two girls. So, so you're going to have a daughter running your, running yeah, your, I, to be running honest, the empire in 25, I, 30 years. It's, She'll that, be uh, talking to the equivalent of me. It's really odd, yeah, because well, I know my dad. My dad really didn't want me to work for Andertons, and certainly really? never put any pressure on me to it. Yeah, because I think if you go back 30 years and you look at your average sort of you know small town music store, it wasn't much of a you were never a small town music store. Oh, Anderton's definitely was a small, you know, well, you no, back no, into the no, 80s. Not, yeah, yeah, when we were there, it was a bit bigger. But anyway, so he, he, he was, he's very proud of what we've achieved. And, and um, it's certainly yeah, but when, pretty, you know, massive now compared to, you know, what no, it was it's ma then. No, it's massive. But you've, um, also, you've also done, you've also, you were the most professional music store back then. Like everything was like clean and organized and well run. Yeah. But it didn't have like the boutique -y feel that you do have now. So what you've done is you've managed to boot. That's that's another thing. I don't, I don't know if you can see that from the outside. But I'm sure it's deliberate or understood or planned. But the reality is, so you still have the professional. Yeah. Everything's clean. Everything works. Everything's laid out. He knows where it is. But it also feels like a cool place to go and hang and try out guitars. I hope so. I no, mean, that's, that's what it all does. I ever, all I ever wanted it to be was where I'd want to go and buy stuff. Yeah, from, exactly. Yeah. You know, so. There you go. That's a good answer. Like when you ask me what, what I do. This is what I wanted when I was a kid. See, see, when I was a kid, I didn't, I didn't have any, I had friends like you to play music, but, you know, and we, there was a lot of us. There was a lot of us back in those days. I do. Uh, I, they were really good times. They're amazing. Really good times. And, uh, and I, always, I always say this, I don't know if I've ever said it on camera, but there was something in the water in our area. You think about the amount of successful yeah. people in the music industry that came from like to... that 10 mile radius. Because you have Patch. Yeah. My friend Matty Butcher is like the front of house for Blur yeah. and Elastica yeah. and, oh, not Elastica anymore, sorry, Blur, Gorillas, and like, he's like the best sound man. Who were the in dudes England. that lived on Recreation Road just down from Anderton's that had, they were another. Lindsay? Jameson? He went over, came over and played with, uh, oh, what was the name of that band? Give I me my think, money. There were two, two brothers, but not. not yeah, Patch. Jameson's. Yeah, was it yeah. the James? Ke Kev Jameson Kev. and Jameson. Kev Jameson. What yeah. was his, that, because that was a, that had didn't. a band called The Deep Season, which was phenomenal. That's right. And, and the bass player was Nick Hannon, and Nick Hannon's yes. brother was Patch. And That's Patch was right. in the Sundays. So you had like these two sets of brothers who were super talented. But you know. Guilford doesn't get enough credit. Well, it wasn't, strictly speaking, it was probably more sort of fleet and They, Palmer, they were wasn't fleet. It? Yeah. yeah, we were all fleet. But, but all sort of Surrey and Hampshire. I mean, it's like uh, Liverpool yeah. gets all the credit for where all the good music came from, but secretly, you know, Surrey and Hampshire. <laughs> Did, did <laughs> remember Yately? Remember, remember Yately. Ross? Do you Ross remember from Yately and then Breathe? Remember Breathe? Do you remember Bagshot? Did you ever go to Pantiles in yeah, Bagshot? Of course, of course we did. We get there together. We probably, probably did, yeah. didn't we? Terrible probably times. Carousing girls thinking that we were going to find a young lady. I don't think we ever really. I don't remember. I think I struck out every time. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I always remember you as a bit of a Lothario, to be honest. With you, I think you know, Casanova. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a, I've got a, re I've got a reputation as a family man to maintain. Oh man, look, it's been fun catching up. Yes, it's just, it's. Mad. Hopefully, this will be edited into something that's worthy to watch. Oh, it'll so. probably just be as it was. It'll yeah, just, yeah. it'll all stay in. Um, and if you have got to the end, thank you. Uh, yeah, and look, I mean, I should probably watch some produce like a pro videos as well because I'd like, you know. <laughs> so I'd, you have I'd a YouTube like channel? I don't know. Do yeah. we have a YouTube channel? I think yeah, we do. Yeah. I, I'm the luckiest man in the world as I, I have no idea what goes on behind the scenes in our YouTube channel. I just, I just show up and get show to play up, guitar, talk and... rubbish with lots of lovely people, and then they make it into magical content. That <laughs> can, I, can I be you for a week? Oh, if you come to the UK, absolutely, you can come and, you know, you can come and critique our studio and see what gear we've got. Yeah. Well, 
there you are. Uh, if you're not familiar with Warren's channel and you're sitting at home a little frustrated wannabe producer yourself as well, you probably get some good advice from there. Um, and if you are familiar with it, then you know, hopefully you've enjoyed this little trip down memory lane with myself yes. and Warren. Anyway, look, man, it's amazing. Marvelous. It's lovely I think we to should play again. some more guitar. Okay, we'll, that was we'll, so we'll much play fun. something. They, um, they can fade out very quickly on, on, on our, on our riffs. <laughs>